Building up a well-orchestrated teamwork is the key to performing power system testing more efficiently and safely and quickly expanding power grids. This is the recommendation of Gustav Lundqvist from Kraft Diagnos. He is our guest in this episode of Energy Talks. My name is Scott Williams from the podcast team at Omicron, and I will be your host. Hello, everyone. Since we last spoke with Gustav Lundqvist in Energy Talks episode number three, he has grown his company Craft Diagnose in relation to both team size and the types of tests performed for customers on both medium voltage and high voltage electrical equipment and power grids throughout Sweden. Touch voltage measurements on power lines are one area of testing that remains in high demand for customers of Craft Diagnose. Gustav explains how he best utilizes his team and testing equipment to perform these potentially dangerous power line measurements over greater distances in a highly safe and efficient way. Hello, Gustav. Welcome back to Energy Talks. Thanks. Gustav, could you describe how the power system is changing in Sweden? For example, I understand that Sweden has planned an increase of 120% in power production by 2045. How will this affect the overall power system? Uh, it's going to be a huge challenge, uh, and there is a lot of new industries uh, coming to the country right now. So we got, for instance, uh, fossil-free steel, uh, and the estimation is that uh, both the hybrid uh, projects and the H2 green steel project it's going to consume uh, approximately 65 to 70 terawatt hours. Wow. Uh, Yeah, and then you got uh, Facebook, uh, you got Amazon, you got Microsoft, and they're all uh, building huge uh, server facilities uh, in the country. And then you got the electric uh, vehicles, both cars and uh, larger vehicles. So it's going to be an interesting journey. And uh, the amount of wind power is going to go from uh, 30 terawatt hours to 90 Wow. Yeah, and it's going to be intense, really intense. And to be able to do this, you're going to have to build an entire new grid system mm-hmm. that is uh, the same size and plus 20% what we have today. And uh, I expect it to be a lot of building of new power lines parallel to old ones. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be a lot of induction issues. In general, what types of electrical equipment are critical for testing on a regular basis in response to this projected growth, and why? It's a mix. Uh, You see, the transformers, they're going to be super critical. And if a large uh, power transformer uh, just uh, gets a fault, large fault, Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's one or two years of delivery time. And uh, then again, you got the CTs, the VTs, the breakers. Uh, mm-hmm. And they're also critical. But I would say that the larger components, uh, they're especially important. Okay. With uh, rising energy prices and also inflation, how is this an argument for testing not only newly installed equipment, but also for increased testing of older equipment? Uh, first of all, if you got uh, uh, inflation on the rise, it's... Uh, becoming more and more evident because if you increase the amount of uh, dollars in circulation by approximately 40 to 50 percent you will get inflation you can't get around it and uh, that means that copper prices are going up oil prices are going up also steel prices prices on labor Uh, and that means that if you buy a component that component becomes more valued Mm -hmm. Because if you have to buy a new one, it costs much more money. Uh, And also, if the energy prices goes up, then you have an outage is much more costly. So you've got to be much more careful when you do the site acceptance testing to do proper analysis. Mm -hmm. And if you've got uh, components that are still in service, they might be 10, 20, 30 years old. Uh, Then you've got to make sure that uh, they do not get a fault or for instance, explode or something. That sometimes happens with the CTs and VTs. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the older components, that's when things get interesting. If you have a a station, a Mm -hmm. 130 kilovolt station, when it's uh, 40, 50 years old, often the grid company just takes all the components, 
all the CTs, VTs, and breakers and just uh, recycle them. But when you think about it, if you've got a station with 100 re really, really expensive components, how many of these components could be able to service at least 20 th or 30 years mm -hmm. beyond the 50 years? I think it's the majority. Because we haven't had that good testing equipment historically. But now we got equipment to perform, for instance, Tan Delta and uh, primary and secondary injection in mm -hmm. CTs and ETs. So I think it's uh, we've got to have a new look at components to extend the lifetime. Busta, since we last spoke, you were in the process of growing your company and adding the types of measurements you perform for customers. What types of diagnostic tests are you now performing for your customers and uh, which Omicron testing solutions are you using? Well, at the moment, we're uh, really established in the grounding measurements, mm -hmm. both for uh, uh, medium voltage stations and for stations over 100 kilowatts. Uh, and we have done a super large amount of testing of touch voltages mm -hmm. along power lines. With a you mentioned voltage. this in our episode number three. Yeah. Uh, and it's essentially how you started your business. And so you're primarily focused in, in this uh, area of measurement. Yeah, but the new thing uh, this year is, first of all, we went for from one employee, myself, mm -hmm. to 10 employees. And we're also recruiting more people at the moment. So I just uh, employed uh, another employee uh, yesterday, essentially. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of funny. I went to the university and had a speech mm -hmm. uh, at a gathering for the electrical engineers. Uh, since uh, I bought a lot of systems, at the moment I got... What is it? Uh, 16 systems from Omicron? Wow. Well, one from B2 Electronics, I should say, the, the daughter company to, to Omicron. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was kind of easy because when I had the lecture for the students uh, and spoke about what we do at Kraft mm -hmm. uh, I showed them a picture of the, for instance, the uh, Sibano 500. I said, hey, which one of you guys would like to work with uh, this device? Because it's just standing here at the moment. Who wants mm -hmm. it? <laughs> and you can, you can guess, because if you're a student and have the opportunity of A, uh, starting at a smaller grid company mm -hmm. and pushing the clock, or you should uh, be taught how to use the Sibano. The Sibano is kind of interesting because it's an awesome device. <laughs> so I think we've got a great future and there's a lot of work to be done. And also, I should say that uh, we have gotten along um, with the Testrano really good. So mm -hmm. both the Testrano, the Drana and uh, Ferneo and the Tan Delta equipment TD12. So we've got guys at the moment who are self-running and can test the power transformer without me being present. So okay. that's a big step forward. Super sweet. Speaking of which, I understand that you have modeled your company, Craft Diagnose, on the way Omicron Support and Omicron Academy function yeah. to put more teams in the field at the same time. Could you describe this? Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to see steal your stuff and make it better, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> and uh, so if, if you look at, at Omicron, uh, it, it's got a couple of great features. Uh, first of all, you got a, the Omicron Academy. Mm -hmm. So when we attended one of the courses, uh, uh, for the transformer uh, testing equipment with uh, Jacob Hemmele. So Jacob showed us, okay, this is how you connect the equipment. Uh, and we just did it and it worked fine. And then I realized, hey, I don't have to be in the field to connect the equipment. Mm -hmm. I can be in the, at the office and tell people how to connect the equipment. Mm -hmm. So we can have a situation where a more experienced engineer is at the office and communicates with the, te with the uh, teams using Microsoft Teams. So you use Microsoft Teams. You have a camera today on every phone. You can film the site. You can film the equipment. Uh, if there is a problem, you can just uh, uh, fix it on remote. Mm -hmm. So thereby you can support mul multiple teams in the same time. Uh, and with uh, the Omicron support system, if you get uh, a really, really uh, difficult problem in the field. You can just call them. But mm -hmm. then I realized, what if uh, I start my own uh, Omicron support system? So the technicians can call me 
or call one of my employees, Robin. He's uh, really skilled at the transformer diagnostic systems. And often we can solve the problem on remote. And this means that we can put a lot of people in the field at the same time. Okay, working more independently. Yeah, sure. One of your company's specialties is performing touch voltage measurements, as you mentioned before, on power lines uh, and that for customers throughout Sweden. Do you have any practical tips for our listeners when measuring touch voltages along power lines, especially about personal gear and um, safety? Yeah, I should say that these uh, types of measurements are really, really dangerous if you're not experienced. So uh, mm-hmm. the first uh, year or so that you're doing it, it's uh, super risky. But when you get more reps, uh, the risk uh, becomes much, much smaller. Uh, and I would say that, uh, for instance, you got to walk a lot. you, you got to have a really high speed in the field. And the reason for that is there is a, a large cost for the grid company when you shut off uh, these types of power lines. Mm-hmm. And uh, for instance, the kind of boots we wear, the kind of insoles and the shoes. Because if you're going to do a lot of walking, you can't just use normal sneakers. It doesn't work. And also, we have experienced uh, uh, safety goggles. Because if there is massive induction from parallel power lines, when you apply the earthing tools, uh, you, you might get a spark. Mm-hmm. And, and if you got white light from a spark, an electrical arc, it might uh, damage your eye. So you got to have uh, the classical 3M uh, welding glasses mm-hmm. when you're doing the risky moments. Okay. Could you describe the difference between induction and influence? Yeah. There is a lot of, I believe, misconceptions of the induction, induction problem. Uh, the induction comes from the current. So if you have a large load on the power line, if the power line, for instance, transmits 500 amperes, maybe 1,000 amperes, you will have a lot of induction. Uh, and the induction drives a large current. And that means that equipment connected to the power line might get heated up. Mm-hmm. And uh, if, you get, uh, if you have a worker that gets in contact with the power line, um, the induction will be able to drive a large current that might uh, cause a nasty arc that might burn the worker. Uh, and there have been a lot of cases in Sweden with people who have gotten either uh, damaged uh, or uh, killed by induction. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's, mm-hmm. not, it's not gonna decrease, it's gonna increase. Because um, the grid companies are increasing their building speed of new power lines with three to four times to meet the demand. Mm-hmm. It's just massive. Uh, influence, on the other hand, comes from the electrical field from the power line. Mm-hmm. And the influence uh, creates a large voltage, but it's not that much charge. So if a, a power line is um, energized by influence, it's kind of easy to discharge it. Uh, induction is more difficult because it contains much more energy. Okay. So... When performing large-scale measurements along power lines, could you describe how teamwork functions at your company, Craft Diagnose, for example, from working in pairs to how it influences the entire group and also management? Yeah. Um, If we go back one or two years, it was just uh, me running along a power line with uh, a 50-kilo rucksack, throwing essentially a carbine over the uh, power lines. Right. But now we're a much more advanced organization. So if you want to test the power lines quickly, then you got to put a lot of people in the field at the same time. Uh, sometimes uh, seven people, sometimes even 10 people mm-hmm. to uh, minimize the outage time. And uh, so when performing these types of measurements, you take a power line out of service. Uh, if possible, you should ground it in the remote end. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you should always have an earthing tool applied uh, along the power line. Because if not, the voltage on the power line might get ramped up. It gets charged. It's like a big capacitor yeah. by the parallel power lines. Uh, this means that if you have a team in the field, and that team, if you're working at one phase, 
uh, that team consists of uh, two work pairs, and these guys uh, apply an earthing tool on the power line. Mm -hmm. And then you do the measurements along uh, the low voltage grid. And then uh, work team A goes along and applies a new earthing tool at another spot. Mm -hmm. That might be one kilometer from the first pylon that you've tested. Uh, and then uh, work pair number B uh, removes the, uh, the earthing tool, essentially. So you'll always have an earthing tool applied to avoid the voltage increase. It's cover and move. You've got to have teamwork in the field. Mm -hmm. And if you got two uh, CPC 100s, you can test uh, two phases at the same time. So you can have a, uh, four guys uh, at one location in the grid testing uh, f phase number one. And you can have four other guys, uh, for instance, 10 kilometers further along the power line and perform testing on phase number two. Mm -hmm. And that means that you can increase the speed on the measurement. And this is super important for the customer. Okay, very good. With teamwork, how does that eventually avoid dangerous voltage increases? Yeah, the most important thing is that you, you always have to have a, a earthing tool applied to the mm -hmm. power line. Uh, and when performing these types of measurements, uh, it's a little bit uh, original how you do things. Uh, you do not have an, a large insulation rod and apply the earthing tools to a power line. It just doesn't work. It's not long enough. And you want to avoid climbing because climbing is kind of dangerous also. Sure. So what we do is that we have a, <laughs> you're going to laugh when you hear this one. We use a fishing rod and throw over a, a, a carbine, mm -hmm. uh, line, and then you pull up a rope that is actually meant for lawnmowers. Uh, and then you uh, uh, pull up a special earthing tool called mm -hmm. the uh, uh, JK51. Mm -hmm. And then that one collapses on to the power line. Uh, and if you need to uh, remove it, you pull the second rope. You have a pulling rope and a disconnection rope. So we've got to have two guys uh, along the power line all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, because it's a lot of risk involved. And secondly, to release the earthing tool. So that's really important. Uh, and when throwing the fishing rod, <laughs> the carbine over the power line, uh, sometimes you got energized power lines really close to you. So you need to be super uh, rigid about reading the sign on the power line pylon. Safety is really, really important. Definitely. So yeah. it's also always better to have uh, more than one person performing this, yeah. of course. Yeah. One person checks the other person. Sure. Now, this is important because I understand that you perform measurements also on live power lines, meaning power lines that are still in operation. Could you describe how you handle these online measurements? Yeah. Uh, what we found out is that there's a lot of power lines that you essentially can't take them out of service. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. Sometimes you'll have to wait uh, one, two or three years to be able to get an outage. And still, that outage might be really, really expensive. It might cost 10,000 euros per hour. That's just a low estimate. Sure. So it's super, super expensive. Newer power lines are often easier. On the other hand, uh, you've got a team building the power line, and the power line need, needs to be energized really quickly. Uh, yes. Yeah. So okay. there's still a really big need for speed. Uh, but... Then again, if you got a power line that is energized, you can't take it out of service. We realized that the cables that comes with the Omicron uh, uh, grounding testing systems, the black uh, cables, I think it's 75, uh, 0.75 square millimeters. You can roll these guys out. You might use mm -hmm. one and a half uh, square millimeters copper also. You can use these type of uh, cables instead of an insulated power line. That means that if you got a live power line that you're going to measure, you can just go mm -hmm. out in the forest with uh, a large amount of cables and apply that 
uh, type of cable to a pylon. Uh, and the CPC100 has no problem driving, for instance, 10 amperes through uh, one and a half or two kilometers of cable. And, and that means if you can get a system that can measure power lines without taking the power line out of service, it's a huge benefit for the customer. Definitely. Uh, and, and I believe that if you have a, a longer power line that cannot be taken out of service, I believe that eventually you will have a voltage drop in the cables, eventually, mm -hmm. if you roll out in the forest. So you've got to have a lot of guys uh, with cable drums walking a lot in the forest. But eventually they will have, you will have a voltage drop and you will not be able to push 10 amperes. The, uh, the current will become, for instance, 5 or 4 amperes. But what mm -hmm. happens if you have two CPCs in sync? Then you will be able to push more current through that cable and measure even longer power lines while they are still in service. You know, I want to come back to that very quickly. How do you use resistors to consume active power from the power line? Uh, we realized uh, really quickly that uh, if you got a power line uh, that is uh, subject to induction and influence, uh, the mm -hmm. influence builds up a really, really high uh, voltage in the power line. And if you look at medium voltage systems, for instance, 10 kilovolts, 20 kilovolts, so on, uh, they use a Peterson coil design and have used that design for uh, almost 100 years. So you got mm -hmm. a Peterson coil and you got a resistor in parallel. And that is no coincidence because the, the resistor has the ability of both to create a resistor current for relays, but it's mm -hmm. also used to reduce the voltage in the system. Because if you remove the resistor that is parallel to a Peterson coil, you will have a um, increased voltage. The voltage will just spike. So that's a known phenomenon. And when I looked at the uh, uh, CPC-1, for instance, uh, I saw a Peterson coil. It's essentially mm -hmm. a coil connected to the grounding system, but it did not have a resistor like the Peterson coils you got out in the stations. And then I just uh, bought a couple of resistors on the internet and mm -hmm. uh, essentially connected them uh, using four millimeter contacts in parallel with the uh, C1. And then the voltage just dropped 90%. It was really interesting. And of course we measure the current that the C1 is able to drive up on the power line and mm -hmm. around to, to the pylon. So we don't get any measurement errors. And the resistance uh, in the uh, unit makes it that the current that is pushed uh, is like uh, 0.5 amperes maximum that is driven down the resistor. So uh, the measurement still works really fine. Excellent. Now going back to energizing uh, the cable, you had mentioned CPC 100 and CPC SYNC. I understand that the CPC 100 multifunctional testing device from Omicron surprised you since it delivers 50% more power than you thought originally. Could you describe what you meant by this? Well, we have used the CPC-1 for two years at the moment. You can push uh, 100 amperes, 50 amperes, uh, 20 amperes, 10 amperes. You can measure impedance, do all this kind of stuff. But it's not really built to be able to push just one current uh, with super high efficiency. So you've got mm -hmm. a couple of smaller uh, transformers in the device that weighs um, around 20 kilos. Mm -hmm. So what I did is that I uh, contacted a, a local transformer producer and asked them, hey, can you guys make a device that weighs 40 kilos with just one transformer, one one-phase transformer. Mm -hmm. and so we've got a much, much larger iron core, much, much uh, thicker copper wire. So you got only one output now, uh, and that is uh, much, much less flexible than a C1. And it's heavier, it's bulkier, 
Uh, but hey, uh, we could drive 15 amperes with a one to two uh, transformer ratio. Mm -hmm. And the CE1, because of its uh, size, it's compact, it's light. Um, it can only drive 10 amperes in that ratio setting. So this CE1 is a much more powerful system than we thought. So 15 amperes, that's uh, compared to 10, it's 50% more power. Gustav, you told me earlier that you were planning to use CPC Sync to deal with heavy induction using two or more CPC 100 devices. How will this setup work? If you use the CE1 uh, when doing step and touch voltage measurements along power line, uh, uh -huh. you use the one to two uh, transformer setting. And that means if you got an induction, for instance, of 1000 volts on the power line, then the induction to the system will become 500 volts. Mm -hmm. So the C1 essentially transforms down the 50 hertz voltage to a much, much uh, more suitable level. But what happens if the induction is, for instance, 2000 volts? Then the C1 will be subject to 2000 volts. And that's mm -hmm. not super optimal because it's not designed for that one. Yeah. And then the voltage to the CPC 100 will become 1000 volts, and we don't want that. But what would happen if you use a large transformer, uh, much, much more heavier than the uh, more flexible C1? A transformer that maybe weighs, for instance, 80 kilos and um, has a, a turns ratio of, for instance, uh, 1 to 6. That means if you got, for instance, uh, 3000 volts on the power line, mm -hmm. you will only have 500 volts to the CPC 100. And the CPC 100 can handle 500 volts. That's no problem. But what will happen then, of course, is that if the uh, CPC 100 uh, drives uh, a current, should we say, of 20 amperes with the C1 mm -hmm. thinking, uh, you will have 20 amperes divided by six. Uh, and that means that you will have much, much less uh, clear signal when doing the measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I realized then is if you got two CPC 100s that are pushing at the same time uh, and they, they can drive a lot of current, that current will be transformed down to a smaller current and you will much uh, likely be able to get a clear signal when performing the measurements out in the field. So in theory, if you got, for instance, two CPC 100s, uh, mm -hmm. you should be able to use a one to six transformer. If you would use three CPC 100s, then you might be able to use a, a one to eight transformer turns ratio and be able to transform down the voltage on the power line. Because the CPC is really different uh, compared to, for instance, a classical measurement system, an old school measurement system with uh, 43 hertz. Uh, those systems uh, that are essentially mounted on a trailer uh, and transform. Uh, well, it's quite cumbersome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so those uh, systems, uh, they will start to um, rotate if there is high induction. And the CPC doesn't do that. The CPC is power electronics. So it will not be affected that much by the induction. Uh, the CPC, however, cannot handle uh, super much uh, voltage. Mm -hmm. It's got a limit of approximately 500 volts. So if you only can reduce the voltage from the power line to the CPC system, then it should be able to deal with the issue. And you had mentioned earlier, um, with such a setup, you can cover much more distance with a measurement. Yeah. Uh, my, my record when driving uh, currents over long power lines with the CPC, with one CPC, uh, is uh, 250 kilometers and down to a remote station and back mm -hmm. again. So it's... Uh, 500 kilometers, but if you can ramp up the voltage that the CPC pushes, you should be able to use 
much, much longer power lines. So you do not have to move the CPC along the power line if you're measuring a long power line. So that's also a really interesting feature. Definitely more efficient. How do you plan to use PTM data sync to help your company increase cash flow? You had mentioned that to me as we were preparing for this podcast interview. If you look at uh, the measurements that we're doing right now, we've got a couple of guys that are really good at transformer testing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if the guys are testing transformers for five days with the Tristrano system, uh, you will have a problem. Uh, When they get home from measurement, you will have a lot of measurement data and you have to deliver a report to the customer. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, sometimes uh, the same guys will have to go away on a second trip the week afterwards. So sometimes uh, the customer will have to wait to get the protocols for like two or three weeks. And the customer doesn't like that. They want uh, instant feedback on how are their transformers uh, essentially uh, uh, suited. They they want info. Uh, And what we realized that if you you got a real experienced engineer uh, at the office, you can uh, have less experienced personnel that are guided uh, who will uh, do the measurements. The measurement result will go up to the, the cloud, essentially, mm-hmm. and down into the computer of the experienced engineer. And that experienced engineer in the office can write the report in the same day, deliver it to the customer at the end of the day, and then you can essentially invoice uh, the customer uh, much, much earlier. So you will, you will have... Uh, the time between the measurement and when you get paid gets reduced a lot. And then you will have cash that can, you can invest in other uh, assets. So that's a really, really big benefit. Definitely. Well, that sounds good. Uh, Gustav, you mentioned to me earlier that you have a story to tell about a 40-hour workday. Now, that's something I personally would not like to experience, but could you tell us more about what you meant by that? Yeah, sure. We got a call from a customer um, this summer that their largest uh, transformer had uh, tripped. So the differential protection had tripped. And if that happens, you do not energize the transformer without mm-hmm. testing. Uh, so what we did is that we got up uh, uh, 04 uh, 30 in the morning, uh, took a long, long car ride to site. Mm-hmm. Uh, and started testing, and we tested the transformer until, uh, I would say, 23 uh, in the evening. And then we had the problem. We needed to get to the next site the morning, uh, the next morning. And that uh, site was uh, located about, uh, what was it, uh, 600 kilometers from the transformer. Wow. So we had to go go into to the car and start driving. Uh, and of course, we ran out of water, ran out of food, uh, and uh, just uh, went into uh, the outside of a random house, got more water, continued driving, got to the station at uh, 5 o'clock. Uh, and then the power lines switched off, and there was time to do a grounding measurements with the heavy current method. Mm-hmm. Uh, had another team uh, meeting, meet, meeting us up there. So they brought the CPC 100 because we used the Testrano. And uh, we did the measurements, and then it was uh, time for the next measurement, essentially. Uh, and then we went away for a 400 kilovolt measurement on a large station. So, yeah, that type of stuff happens sometimes. I don't recommend it. But looking back on it, it's uh, kind of funny. Uh, it's like uh, being drunk at work. You shouldn't do it, but <laughs> <laughs> so that was a really interesting experience. But I think the customers really like it when, when you do everything you can to help them. Definitely, and uh, such commitment over a, a long period of time to get the jobs done. Yeah, yeah. and the important thing, if, if you got to do that type of stuff, you got to just work slower, reduce the tempo, because you're not, you don't have the same reaction time. Uh, you don't have the same reflexes, just lower the pace on everything. And that's also important in terms of safety as well. Oh, yeah, that's really, really important. But uh, I, I, my hope is that we got, we've got more people in the company that are 
scaled in various systems, um, mm -hmm. we will not have to do that type of stuff. You can just send someone else to the site. Well, Gustav, thank you very much for joining us again for this episode of Energy Talks. It is always interesting and inspiring to speak with you. Thanks. And a big thank you to our audience for listening to this episode of Energy Talks. We always welcome your questions and feedback. Simply send us an email to podcast at omicronenergy.com. Omicron has several years of experience in many areas of power system testing, and it offers you the matching solution for your application. For more information, be sure to visit our website at omicronenergy.com. There, under training, you will discover the wide variety of online courses and webinars offered by Omicron Academy on many power system testing topics. Please join us to listen to the next episode of Energy Talks. Goodbye for now, everyone. Mm -hmm.